Welcome to Making Pittsburgh Healthy. Today we have Mike Collins on the line. He has sugaraddiction.com. Mike has been sugar free for over 30 years. You're probably wondering, oh my gosh, well, he's going to share his secrets and, and we can all be sugar free or better off. His book has been rated number one in healthy living on Amazon. So you are in for a real treat. We all have a problem here, Mike. So welcome to the show. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, married, kids, what do you like to do for fun, and what gets you up in the morning? <laughs> that, uh, that's a new one, and I'll, I'll do my best to, to include the, uh, the family. I have a partner who I've been with a long time. Uh, I have two adult children who are twins, identical twins, who I also were raised with no flour, no sugar since they were in the womb until they were six years old. So that, I, I think that of all my accomplishments is probably the biggest one. Um, you know, I, I started this thing as a regular kid. You know, I, 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 I thought that I, we were normal. And I, you know, my mother was a sugar junkie. She loved sugar. She thought sugar was love. And there's a story behind that one too. But, you know, we would have bread and butter sugar sandwiches literally and kool-aid with three times the uh the amount of sugar and if i didn't scrape like a half an inch of sugar off the bottom of the bowl of my cheerios mm. I, I didn't put enough sugar we had unfettered access to the sugar bowl right there's a great video on youtube your listeners would love it's eric clapton talking with ed bradley of 60 minutes and they're in his seven million dollar antigua treatment center and uh, Ed Bradley of 60 Minutes says, so Eric, now this is the classic guitar player everyone knows, right? And he says, this whole addiction thing started with heroin, right? And he says, no, Ed, it started with sugar. Wow. And he goes on to talk about bread and butter and sugar sandwiches, which we used to eat, and how it changed his state. And he didn't know it like I didn't know it until in hindsight, right? When we look back at our history, so fast forward, I loved everything, you know, as a kid. And, you know, 13 or 14, I run into alcohol and drugs, right? Well, I knew that changed my state. <laughs> I mean, I could finally talk to girls. I mean, th there was a, a definite benefit. And, uh, and again, I didn't realize I just wanted to go party that, you know, I grew up in a kind of a rough, rough area. And, and I didn't realize that I was covering feelings up, emotions up, right? So fast forward, and we can talk about that, but I'm an open book on that. But I got sober at 28, and I started to realize that the friends around recovery, they were gaining a lot of weight really fast. Now, I gained some, but not, you know, I was being very observational about all the snacks and sugar and that was going on in those meetings and stuff. And I started to see that, you know, people were getting diabetes diagnosis, they were getting sick and stuff, but they'd gain like 50, 60, 100 pounds in a year really mm. fast. And I realized that they were just substituting one drug for another, right? They were just changing drugs. And so I read a book called Sugar Blues, and Sugar Blues was a book about... Um, it was came out in the 70s, redone in the 80s, and the author was at a party one time, and he and he heard voice from behind go, "I would." He's putting two lumps of sugar in his coffee, and he goes, "I wouldn't have that stuff in my house, let alone my body." And the person was Gloria Swanson, the movie star, right? And so they married. And it was her her third marriage, and she was older, and and they just promoted that book all over the world. And, and I, I got a hold of it and I just kind of snapped in my head that I love the history lesson of going from England to Africa, picking up slaves, going to the Caribbean and in, in South America, picking up sugar rum and everything. And England grew an empire. 300 years ago, England, England grew an empire uh, bigger than El Chapo ever dreamed of. And it was all on the backs of slavery and sugar. And I love that story. And so I just started studying it and I went on to have a regular career. I raised the kids sugar free. It was something, you know, was incorporated into my uh, alcohol and drug recovery and abstinence. And I, like I said, I had a regular career. And about 10 years ago, I picked up the uh, domain sugaraddiction.com and uh, I started supplying information on kind of a part time basis. And I gave the folks the best information out there. I mean, I literally was like really researching it, wanting to have a good website and all that kind of stuff. 
And what happened was it wasn't until about three years ago. I mean, people would get some success, but what happened was about three years ago, I started doing one-on-one coaching and having group forums and stuff like that. And that's when the, the success rate just took off. And I started to realize that there was a difference between, because you can get all this information online about you know how bad sugar is for you and all that kind of stuff. But it wasn't until we got into a group setting and a new tribe for the folks that they didn't feel alone because this is an isolating thing. I mean, you can still give this drug to a one-year-old right now and no legal or moral or ethical uh, you know, worries about that. And But my thing, and we talked about it just briefly before we went on the air, is that I show people how to stay stopped. We talked about the study where people... Um, they'll lose a bunch of weight and all diets say, you know, the sugar, the white stuff, all that kind of stuff, flour and potatoes and rice. And that's a good thing, right? But most people gain it all back. And our process gets to the folks so that they understand and the reasoning, and we can talk about it probably for the rest of the, uh, the podcast, but why people and how people and the science behind staying stopped. So that's the short podcast version. It usually brings up more questions than it answers. So I'm going to stop there and let you, uh, you know, ask a couple of questions. I'll take a little water here. I hope, I that, I hope that helped. I, I love it. And I, um, I did, I have five children. I did not raise them sugar free, but we were, we didn't have much sugar in the house. We didn't have a sugar bowl. And it was funny. My mom, um, she did have a sugar bowl in her house. And she said, one of my kids was over her house one day and climbed up on the, uh, it was my daughter, Heidi, (laughs) my second daughter, I had four girls and a boy. And she said, Heidi climbed up on the counter and she had her hand in the sugar bowl eating this, Aaron. And I was like, what? And she goes, you're depriving them of sugar. They are lacking sugar. I said, mom, they're not lacking sugar. I said, if I put a piece of broccoli down and a piece of, and and some sugar, a lollipop, I said, if I'm in the room, they'll eat the broccoli. I said, as soon as I leave the room, they're going to dive into the sugar because they know how it tastes. Why don't we, why don't you explain? You said sugar drug. Sugar is a drug. I think Mm. that's going to blow people, their mind away. Like, wait a second. A drug, yeah. we're giving a drug to a, a, a one-year-old. We're given, yeah. you know, as a treat. And, and I think we've been trained, somehow we've been trained, of like, hey, you, you won the game. Let's get ice cream. Let's get a treat. I still nice. catch myself saying it. I'm like, my goodness, I'm so ingrained in this, um, this thought process. Mm-hmm. Let's start there with uncover the drug part, the, the seriousness behind it. Because if we don't see this as serious, we're mm-hmm. not going to move forward. We have to see it as devastating so why don't you jump into that part no thanks for for bringing it up that way because most people don't look at it that way to be honest with you and you know i was nervous and i still am you know we're talking about an industry that's you know got a b in front of it a billion dollar industry Mm -hmm. that you know they have shareholder value to protect and you know there's been kind of a i i want to say i want to say it I'll probably get some mail, but the duped, we've been duped over 30 years as high fructose corn syrup came into the diet and, you know, sweeteners and sugar. And we probably know about the whole sugar and fat thing back in the 70s and 80s when they took a left when they should have taken a right. But the right. bottom line is, is that the science is now there. It's exploding. I, I, you mentioned early on, we do a quit sugar summit every year. And I've interviewed over 200 of the most Cornell, Harvard, all of the educators who are studying the sugar over the years, and the science comes out now daily, that the uh, the sugar, granulated powdered sugar, processed food, processed food, you know, it all literally affects the nucleus accumbens, it, the dopamine, serotonin, norepinephrine, GABA, the oxytocin, even the adrenals are affected, and. and and not, it's not that it's not in a good way because you get a nice dopamine hit. You feel good when you have the stuff, right? And it's not like heroin or meth where, you know, it's going to screw up your life in five or two or three or four or five years. This, the, the effects take decades to uh, decimate the body. You know, we all know about the body part. We know about the glucose and the insulin resistance and the, this is all public now. It's all over the internet. 
But what is not as well known is the brain science around fructose, okay? And just for your listeners, I'm sure most of them know, but half of this table sugar molecule is fructose and the other half is glucose, right? Now, in my world, it's a freaking drug. It's not the same glucose as in a vegetable or whatever, mm -hmm. and it's not the same fructose as in fruit. Um, and we'll get to that fruit stuff in a minute, but um, what happens is, the fructose hits the dopamine, uh, your dopamine receptors, and you get a nice little buzz. Now, dopamine was meant to chase food and sex as we evolved, and it was, you know, it's, it's evolved over millions of years. And just in a really short period of time, 300 years, which is a blip in, in our, our evolutionary history and how the body developed, we're now pounding it with 20 to 30 teaspoons. That's average mm. a day, right? And we're just never not moving, manually manipulating our dopamine and serotonin receptors. And what happens is they thin out. Technically, you know, scientifically, there is less of them because we're just, uh, and a lot of people, like I believe myself, uh, started in the world, I believe, with less dopamine receptors. My mother gained 60 pounds on a 105 pound frame and she told me point blank she mostly ate sugar products during her pregnancy she you know my father thought it was cute to get her all these sugar things right mm -hmm. and so we start i think some people start out with less dopamine receptors because it does pass the placental barrier and you know kids uh, i don't even we can't we'll go to the kids if you want later but i just think it's kind of criminal but, you know we now have obese two, three, four, five-year-olds, and they don't choose their own food. Not only are they obese, they have fatty liver. This is a alcoholic's disease, okay? This is a disease that, you know, normally, because fructose, remember, that half of the sugar molecule can only be processed in the liver. They cannot, it, and it, there's no other way in the body, and it, excess fructose is turned to fat, right? And so, again, these are things that are very well researched online. It can be very easily researched online. They're just not common knowledge, right? It's not something where we're thinking about all these things when we're giving our kids, like you said, some sugar. We're going, you know, we won the game. This is now enculturated, if you will, over 300 years where every celebration from Christmas to Easter to Valentine's to birthdays, uh, to bar misfit, it doesn't matter, is a sugar holiday, you know? And then the everyday sugar and the sugar sweetened beverages, which is literally tanking. I mean, the, the soda industry is way down because people are starting to realize that they're not going to at least drink their, their, their calories and their sugar. They, they, they're thinking about their weight. So anyway, again, I, I could go on for ever about how bad and, and what the science is and i'd love to answer any questions but that's not the reason people can can't stay stopped it's not they're not thinking about their body and they're not thinking about their weight loss or they are thinking about it but it's not the reason they can't stay stopped the reason they can't stay stopped is they're manually manipulating their dopamine serotonin norepinephrine gaba and the big oxytocin which is the bonding one that you know, ecstasy and a hug, you know, the, it's a really important um, brain reward chemical that most people don't even know much about. So anyway, I, I just, it makes me kind of sad, like I said, for the kids, because, and I think this is a 30 year game. We've got to, you know, reorganize just like seatbelts in cars, uh, smoking, uh, condoms in bathrooms, drinking and driving or drinking period. When the science finally says this is what happens, not only does there need to be a movement and a social understanding, there needs to be kind of a tipping point. Mad, Mothers Against Drunk Driving changed that. Um, the tobacco litigation changed that. The AIDS movement changed the, you know, the sexually transmitted stuff. So when that happens, and be it the litigation that's gonna start someday soon, the society will shift, right? And we're just early, you know, we're just early. Guys like you who are willing to, you know, have guys like me talk about this stuff are, are really doing public service, I believe. So anyway, I'm rambling, but.
No, I, I, you're not rambling. This is good stuff. And, you know, one thing, I'm just taking notes. I love this stuff. Um, one thing you said is, you know, obese kids, it's, this is criminal. And yeah. it breaks my heart. I, when I'm out in the store and I see this, this the obesity just keeps rising. And I, I remember watching the movie, The Ten Commandments. And mm -hmm. when all these people were heading, you know, out of Egypt, they were leaving, they were all in like loincloths. And I remember this was probably 15 years ago. I was watching this show and I looked and I thought, there's no obese people in this movie. <laughs> Everyone's right. thin. I'm like, mm -hmm. this was back in, I don't know, the 40s, 50s, it was taken. And I think if you had to round that amount of people up now, it would be harder. It'd be much harder. And I, I, my vision is I see this all the time. And I think this is criminal because these children, they don't have a choice. They can't. Mm -hmm. Their parents will say, well, that's just what he likes. And I'm like, well, is he, does he have a job? Does he go buy the food at the store? It's, you know, <laughs> right. You're feeding him. Just get yeah. it out of the house. He'll cry for a day and then he'll be, he'll be clean. <laughs> it's like, yeah. you know, any other kind of addict. Um, yeah. The tipping point, I, I hope we are getting close to the tipping point. And when you said, you know, sugar, uh, the, the soda industry is down. I was unaware of that. I, I man, that's amazing yeah. because yeah. When I look at these bottles of 20 ounce bottles of Mountain Dew, these people, you know, carry around, it's about 70 to 80 grams of sugar. Wow. And that's, that's, that's only one. So we do some weight loss in our office and people, patients will tell me, well, I drink about two, two liters a day and sometimes two, two liters a day, four liters a day of Mountain Dew or Pepsi. You know, how do you do this? Yeah. And it's just so great. So, um, the, the chemical addiction, you know, when you were talking about manually manipulating these hormones and chemistry in our brain. So here we are, we are eating, drinking these, these chemicals. They're automatically changing. How do we start moving out of this? I, and I, I agree with you. I, I think most people realize, oh, crap, I, I, I love this stuff. I got to stop eating. Nobody says, really? Sugar's bad for you? Everyone agrees with you, Mike. But they just... They can't go to step two. What, mm. what do we need, you know, from your expertise, what do we need to start making ground in this and maybe yeah. shedding some light that they can have a, a, an, an action step that's reasonable than to just say, well, just stop eating all sugar. Because they, they think it's, it's 100% one or the other. And many times it's way too hard. They try it for one day and, or their doctor says, you need to lose weight, start eating salad. So they eat a salad for a day, they hate it, they feel sick, and they say, well, it's just not for me. So how, how do we start moving in this direction um, to, 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 to make a change? Yeah, no, it's a great question. And uh, one that, you know, my story about the uh, seven years of giving great information and got a little success, but the real success happened when um, I started to realize that this is no different than any other recovery from uh, an addictive substance. And we're early and societally, there's a couple of components to it. Societally, uh, like you said, uh, your, 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 your mom thought that she, the child was deprived. I had the same thing. My, you know, my parents and grandparents, they all thought it was, they were depriving the kids, right? That this is something they should have. Right. And in order to like change that paradigm, there's two things that need to happen. One, many people need to tell their story and reduce the stigma of this actually, uh, you know, being a sugar-free person, right? Or having a sugar-free family, right? And uh, the second part is the social component of it. You need to join a new tribe, right? You have to have a group of people, like anything you try and do, if you try to become a great athlete or a great student, you can't, you know, you can't, I love the phrase, you become the average of the five people you hang around with the most. Right. Now, this is a proven fact, okay? This is a scientific peer-reviewed fact about weight and weight loss and weight gain, is that you will become the average of the five people that you hang around, the weight side. You will, you know, you'll eat the same, and a lot of times the people that start with us, they're don't, they don't get any support, not even in their family, not even from their spouse, because their spouse doesn't, they, they don't cotton to this. They don't want to do this. They're not, they haven't done the research. They haven't maybe had the pain, maybe the physical things go wrong, or maybe a diabetes diagnosis or whatever, you know, weight gain, lots of weight gain over the years. 
the brain fog, I mean, people, we didn't even talk about that. I mean, people, brain fog goes away. It's, you know, they're calling di uh, Alzheimer's diabetes three now. We know it affects the brain. So the two main things, so along with good information, because I gave good information for seven freaking years, is to understand the social component, understand you're going to be alone unless you join a new tribe, a new group of people, be it online or local. And, you know, you've got to listen to people who have gone before you, people who have lost 200, 300 pounds, or even the folks that have just lost their 30 or 40 that they gained over 20 years, one or two pounds a year, but then they, and they tried everything. I mean, I got coaches that used to be Weight Watchers uh, leaders, right? They led the meetings, right? 20, 30 years of struggling uh, to get, you know, their weight under control. And none of it, none of it worked until they uh, went to abstinence, right? So the, you know, the tenets of it, and, and also there's a really, really important, a third one that is you know, what we call cravings interruption, basically, is in, in what it is, is that, and this is kind of a little complex and it takes a little setup, but it's very important in the process. And what happens is, as we grew up, because we're manipulating the dopamine and serotonin manually with sugar, as children, you know, mom was busy, my mom had three other kids, she worked, and that back in that day, years ago, that was not that common. And uh, when she was busy, she would hand me a cookie and head me to the TV, right? And, and because if I was upset, crying, worried, anxious, scared, I would think worry, sugar, anxious, sugar, scared, sugar. Now, I did not do this consciously, right? Eric Clapton did not do this consciously. We did it because that's what we were acclimated to because the product was almost free. You could just open the cupboard or the refrigerator. Uh, it, was, it was ubiquitous. It was everywhere. It's very inexpensive. And what does a kid spend his allowance on, right? Mm -hmm. Buck, two bucks back then was just candy. That was it, you know? And it started, it's, now it's a cultural norm. I mean, when was the last time you saw a movie where a woman got dumped that she didn't have an ice cream party and a big celebration with her friends? I mean, the same thing happens. People have been unconsciously using this psychoactive drug to help manage their emotions, right? And when they stop, all of a the sudden, they're like, oh my goodness, I've got headaches, I'm anxious, I'm nervous, I'm scared, I'm you know, crying, weeping. People literally weep for days during withdrawals because now, A, their normal everyday stressors are just hitting them right in the face and they're having physical withdrawals, and now, and sometimes during the first year, or really sometimes right away, people have covered up traumas of different kinds with sugar. The people that were really affected, two and 300 pounds, they didn't use drug and alcohol. They used sugar. They used flour, overdosed on sugar and flour to stop the thoughts of um, bullying or um, sexual trauma or something. And you don't necessarily have to have had these heavy traumas, uh, but you have become accustomed to using this, this drug to overcome just mild upsets, right? And you did it unconsciously. Now you just think it's part of your life. And then when you do that cutoff and you stop, all of a sudden, now you have to have other emotional management tools, right? You have to have other emotional management, uh, like take a walk, get a hug, go to yoga. Uh, do something different that normally that's how we get dopamine, right? We, it takes effort, takes exercise, takes something, preparing food, different food. But now all we got to do is reach for the stuff and stay on the couch. We still get the dopamine hit. And again, this is, I don't think that complex. I try and simplify it as best I can so that people understand in the drug and alcohol recovery world, if you, it's a very common tenet, it's a structure of recovery, is if you started using alcohol and drugs when you were 13, 14, 15 years old, that's when you stop maturing emotionally. These are the phrases that they use, right? And if you look at 
the people, and I go to the late stage folks and the two and 300 pound overweight people, they, they go through this same recovery. They have to figure out a way to manage their emotions. And the idea that someone's only 20, 30, 40 pounds overweight, uh, and this same process isn't at work, one of the things I love, one of the sayings I love is Tofi. Uh, I said Tofi? Yeah, thin on the outside, fat on the, thin on the outside, fat on the, thin on the outside, ins- outside, fat on the inside, where people have the same effect physically, where they're, they have fat around their organs, and you don't necessarily have to be an overweight person for the things that I just described to be effective. Athletes, especially, who have been thin their whole life, then start gaining in their 30s and 40s, they have used, I, have, I worked with an Olympic athlete, right? And she told me the exact same story. She could do anything with her body, but she was using these products to cover up, you know, her worries with about her kids and her mother and her sister and her husband. I mean, and when she finally, when they make the connection, I had a guy lose a hundred pounds on a keto diet, right? And he still had 60 to lose, and he really was um, wanting to do this, right? But he kept being drawn back to the sugar. This was his reason he plateaued. And when we finally made the connection that this 12-year relationship that he had been in with a woman um, was every single time he had, quote-unquote, relapsed or gone back to the the sugar, there was an upset with this partner. And when he put the two together... He finally stopped and lost the relationship too. But what you understand what I'm getting at is that this, I have this same story over and over and over. When they finally make the connection between managing their emotional states and their sugar use, then they get well. And then they change and then they can stay stopped and make it a lifestyle as opposed to, you know, being on the up and down yo-yo, you know? So, yeah, again, it's, it's a little complex, the social, uh, the support system, the stories, but it really that emotional hook, that emotional um, power. And people, people don't think of it as being that powerful. You know, they don't think of it as an, an analgesic, an emotional analgesic. They think of it, but they have to remember they're not looking for their cravings. They're not looking for a sweet hit. They're looking for a dopamine hit. If they can just make that, connection. Um, and one of the amazing parts is if you get 30, 60, and preferably 90 days with total 100% absent, absent from flour and sugar, what happens is when you do take a little sugar, you're like buzzed, right? You're like, and folks really at this level, you get to be our age, you're an adult, you're not trying to get a buzz anymore. You're just trying to get back to normal. You're just trying to be even in the day so you don't start withdrawals that, you know. And people think that their anxious moods and their ups and downs and stuff, their irritability, they think this is life. This is normal. But it's not normal. It's like a up and down of their sugar use. And they can see it in their kids in a party, you know, they can, but they can't see it in themselves, right? Anyway, I'm rambling again, but you get it. I, I could talk forever on this stuff, and you ask great questions, but I don't want to want to monopolize. You're, you're, you're doing awesome. I love it. Um, and, and you know, when you were talking about stigma and social, uh, a while back, I I wanted to stop drinking. I was I told this on my other podcast, and I, I mm. started listening to Recovery Elevator by Paul Churchill. And I know Paul. I was on the show. Yeah, the, like great, great podcast. So th- there was yeah. a time in my I'm 54 in my forties that I said, I should stop drinking. Mm. I wouldn't drink a lot, but I, I like beer. And I started noticing that I was addicted to it, that if, mm. if I was craving it mentally, I wanted to mm. hit, I wanted the buzz. And when I hit, when I got one, as soon as I hit one, as soon as it touched my tongue, I was going for four. And mm. it was just one of those things. You're not going to stop me until I get a buzz. And I thought, this is not good. I don't like this. I wasn't drinking a case <laughs> at night. So I was listening to his podcast and he, this is the same thing. It's a stigma and they're trying to change that. And there are actually um, parties and events and dance clubs that are alcohol free clubs. So they're mm-hmm. trying to, to switch it just like what you're saying with the sugar free events or social events. And if we hang around, so, you know, 
I, I would, when we were going out to dinner, I would think, okay, hon, let's go to this place because it has a good IPA. Let's not mm -hmm. go there because they don't have beer. And I'm like, why, why am I doing this? This is absolutely, it was starting to like, just control me a little bit. And I didn't like it. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing with the sugar. If we, if you hang around everyone who's having sugar, you it's very hard to say no. And mm -hmm. I don't have a lot of friends. <laughs> I'm a real likable guy, but I don't have a lot of friends because there's so many people with bad habits. I, I, my friends are like podcast people and, and famous people that are doing amazing things. I try to listen and hang around that in my mind to elevate yeah. my own, own mind. Um, but this, this, is, this parallels alcohol. It's the same thing. You know, we see oh, yeah. alcohol as a drug. And we know that as a drug, you're not allowed to have alcohol until you're 21 in most states. Maybe other countries are different. But here's sugar. You're, you know, you're three months old and you're given a sugar bottle. You're a day old in the hospital and you're given sugar water to get them to drink. And I, I'm, as soon as I hear that, I'm like, you, it's like giving them a line of cocaine. I'm like, why do they do that? Don't do that. So yeah. is it, is it, here's the, the million dollar question. Is it possible to be sugar free? And if it is, I know you're going to say yes. If it is, people are going, what? This guy's, a, this guy's crazy. How? So, you know, we see this and we say, okay, let's, let's start with trying to reduce it. Let's start getting, getting it out of the house, the friends and family. That's a big nut to crack, I would think, for most people. But what are some practical ways that if somebody's listening to this and say, okay, I have a problem. They, let's say it's a single mom with two kids and the kids mm -hmm. are driving them not her mom nuts and it's easy to say here's some ice cream go sit down and we know mm -hmm. that that's only temporary because as soon as the ice cream <laughs> the sugar gets in their bloodstream they become monsters and now it's something <laughs> worse uh so how is it practical to to actually start moving in this direction yeah no it's a it's a 64 million dollar question there it's the it really is the uh, I call it a big, hairy, audacious problem. Uh, the yeah. problem is there in society, in the world now, because we've exported our eating habits all over the world, you know? Um, yeah, I, I just, uh, you know, some of the things that I mentioned before, I think uh, it's, you got to keep telling the stories, uh, people who have done it and know, you know, know that it's possible, but you have to realize that you've got to join a new crowd. You know, you got to start listening, like you say, listening to people who have, done something that you're interested in doing and hang with them be it just online or you know whatever and just listening to their their information so you know there's no i mean yes look you gotta get this science if you want if that's what you want but that's there and you have to have the information and that's there um but you also have to have like you got to go through with i mean this is and so it's so weird because so many people have done this like five or six times. They've gone through the withdrawal period. They've gone through the early days, the first, um, and it's different for everyone. You know, it's, it's roughest during the first 10 days or two weeks. And for some folks, uh, it's kind of hard for 30 days, but there's also something in regular recovery uh, called pause post acute withdrawal syndrome which, you know, if you include the caffeine, which we haven't talked about, which is another thing that I think there's wired together, fired together kind of thing. They're, they're kind of combined. You're always having chocolate, which is both tea and, and coffee, which is, has both sugar and stuff. So it's like Pavlov's dogs. Once they get the, a little hit of the caffeine, even though they're sugar-free, they start, you know, the cravings come back. So you got to think about, you got to know, you got to have a guide, you have a guide who has actually been through all this because I, if I could have one story, I've got a hundred of people saying, well, I was 64 days, no sugar. And then uh, I was at a, a wedding and I thought maybe I could just have a little, maybe I could just have one. And this is a big one for folks in the early days, okay? Like when I kind of <laughs> approach them that they can may possibly never have sugar again or that they might not want to have sugar again once they, uh, uh, you know, abstain for 60 or 90 days, that they'll feel so much better, lost so much weight, the brain fog is cleared, their skin is cleared up. A lot of uh, things have happened, positive things have happened. They're more motivated, they sleep less then they don't want to go back. But in the early days, when I tell them that 
possibly one of the things I did learn uh, working at the Food Addiction Institute is that about a third of people biochemically cannot handle this in their system, right? About a third of people, and these are general numbers and, you know, because they're, this is like um, a newer science and, you know, some of these guys own treatment centers, so they've seen quite a few people go through this process. Um, about a third of people can go either way back or, you know, they can fall into the sugar stuff and, and push this addiction or they can quit. And then there's a third of people we all hate. They can have half a cookie and just leave it. They're normies. You know, they're just, they can process it. It's, it's not affecting their biochemistry. Personally, I think it is. Uh, it's like you, you're a light drinker and, but you always kind of felt it. Um, it. It's like, I personally think that it's still affecting them, but they can handle it better and they're not, drawn to it in such a strong way for a lot of reasons, uh, personal chemistry, biochemistry, uh, uh, be, how they grew up, how they were raised, how they use the sugar. And so it's a lot of acceptance. It's a lot of accepting that the possibility exists that my biochemistry and sugar don't mix, you know? And when you kind of like it's hard at the beginning because you don't want to be left out. You don't want to be not social. Um, so it's that acceptance that, you know, okay, this is a reality. It's not a well-known reality yet, but it seems to be my reality. And then to give themselves permission, we call it the gift of 90 days, to give themselves permission to test their body for 90 days, right? And see, look, we're adults here, right? If I told you to stop eating steak for 90 days, you'd say, I like steak. If I told you to stop eating broccoli for 90 days, you'd say, I'm a vegetarian, I like broccoli. But you'd do it and you wouldn't be freaky about it. You just do it, you know, you eat other stuff. And I call this a scratch test. Like if you were gonna go to an allergist and they'd like say, uh, they scratch you for ragweed and pollen and all this other stuff. This is your, and actually you can do it for sugar now too, but, um, this is your scratch test. And the way it is accomplished is to just simply go for uh, 90 straight days, no flour, no sugar, and caffeine if you can do it, um, and see, just, we're adults here. Why are we struggling with this? If you're a health, if you can profess to be a health conscious person, why wouldn't you wanna take this test and this 90 day examination and just see if your body changes, if your state, if your how you feel, how you sleep, how you react to other people, you know, if all the things that I've been saying through this podcast are true, where you're emotionally, you know, upheaval for 30 or 60 days, and then it starts to even for you. I mean, just check it out, man. Just, just take the test. One of the things that I believe changes the world, um, uh, in a huge way is called a continuous glucose monitor. Now, while it doesn't address the fructose, um, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're always together, usually 95% of the time. You can snort, you can get straight crystal fructose these days, but don't even get me started on that. Um, but a continuous glucose monitor is like those things that you prick your finger with and check your glucose, right? And a continuous glucose monitor is like a little patch you wear, like a nicotine patch on your arm or your belly. And it can literally transmit to your phone in real time um, your glucose. So if you eat something, a banana or a chocolate bar or drink a, you know, a big fruit juice or a Coke, you'll watch in real time as your glucose spikes. Because we can't see the inside of ourselves, right? We can't see us, you know, we can't see what's going on. And a lot of people, athletes and whatever, they're thin, they don't worry about it, but they're still getting this insane uh, glucose uh, insulin spike and they're, you know, they can see, see it. Apple and Google are currently working on non-invasive ones. The one I described requires a prescription, Dexcon 6, but you can usually get it from a doc. Just tell them you're worried about prediabetes and usually your insurance will cover it. So check that out. Um, I think the world changes on that axis and people are, the, the biohacker culture kind of takes over a little bit. And all you gotta do is look at your Fitbit and know that you've eaten something um, that's affecting your, your sugar. 
so yeah, I mean, there's a there's a lot of different ways. I probably even forgot the question you were talking about. Got talking again, but you know, you get what I'm saying. There's a lot of a lot of ways now out there. You just have to. One of the things I find is that um, the people that we find success with, people that find success that we've gone through, they're kind of pioneers. They're willing to take this stuff that you and I are talking about and implement. You know, they're, they're willing to do it. They're willing to try it out for the 90 days and see how they feel. Um, so they're early adopters, they call it in Silicon Valley. I call them the canaries in the coal mine. You know, they're the folks that they come aware of this earlier than society in general. And as society moves in this direction, uh, like the reduction of the sugar sweetened beverage market, um, they start to, you know, move in that direction of their own personal and family health. So, yeah. You know, the, the whole possibility thing, I, I love that. When we are listening to shows like this, we're hearing from you, you've been sugar free. You work with people, they become sugar-free. This is this parallels perfect with alcohol. It's the same thing that I've heard. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting when you said, you know, about the possibility. If we're hanging around people that are doing it mm -hmm. and we hear it, then it's 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 possible. It's right. probable. It, it can happen. It's not an unknown. Mm -hmm. So when when they heard about the four-minute mile and and Roger Bannister broke the four-minute mile, boom. All of a sudden, I forget what the number is, but 50, 60 people did it shortly after yep. they, they would they somebody was going to break it at one point but as soon as they knew it was a possibility somebody did it right. in their mind then they said it may be achievable let's try it and mm -hmm. my golly we did it um the uh, being aware uh when we're aware of this then we can start moving towards this and and i think when we're aware of something we know and maybe we write it down or we hear it um, then our mind begins to change and it's then our subconscious and our conscious can say yes we can do this too but if mm -hmm. and and i go back to the social thing and the stigma thing but if we go right back into our group of people and they say come on man you're taking this too far <laughs> you know yeah. you don't have to be sugar free just reduce it but it's funny if if you in all these po I listen to hundreds of podcasts on alcohol, the people that finally would say, you know what, I, I'm stopping drinking. And whether they had a big problem or they didn't or people knew about it, anyone they told, probably 99% would be like, wow, that's awesome. Mike, that's great, yeah. man. Don't worry. Yeah. You're safe here. We're not going to get have alcohol <laughs> around you. Good for you, man. I wish I could be like you. They praise you. They put you on a platform and they support you. But I don't see this. This is the stigma. This is a show, social thing. If I went to a party and say, hey, I'm not doing any sugar, they'll look at me like, come on, man. You're healthy. You're thin. You can have fun. And what's interesting, it was funny. My wife, when you were talking about the third, people can't handle it and some go either way and some don't. Um, I'm the one I can't handle it. When I, I think I'm getting better and I'm way better because I've, I've learned to control it. But I remember at one time, this was years ago, I would buy a bag of M&Ms at the store. And the, the peanut M&Ms, instead of mm -hmm. buying a small bag, I bought the monster 10 pound, whatever it was. And I justified it with, hun, we have five kids at home. Somebody <laughs> is going to eat these. So we would get in the car and soon as it would hit my lips, boom, I would start handfuls of them. And she would look at me and say, what are you doing? She said, give me those. And I was like a, a, a dog. I'd be like, I'll chew your arm off. Don't you dare take this away from me. And I'm like, this, this is the chemical change, the dopamine. The, ah, yeah. Um, so I, I, I totally agree with you. And, and it is, once you stop putting it in, it takes a few days. And I've seen this with our patients. I had a lady when she uh, was addicted to the, the sugar and the alcohol, the, she wanted to lose 100 pounds. She was addicted. She was drinking you know, oodles of Pepsi and sugar. It, I said, give me three or four days. I said, I, I promise you, it, it, it will change. And it was like her fourth day. She goes, oh my gosh, I don't crave it anymore. And I said, just, just hang tight. <laughs> don't, don't mess it. Just keep doing what I'm telling you to do. And she ended up losing a hundred pounds in 11 months because nice. once her body started the process and she did, she was diligent. She wrote down everything she ate. So she was mm. aware of it. She knew what she was eating. 
it then it it was good and people were praising her so the stigma was well good for you you're losing weight hallelujah we'll support you um we have a, i think we have a, a ways to go here with the sugar thing uh but it's it's only going to come if we do like you said we keep talking about it we see it's possible we hear other people doing it it's not weird you know they look at me and they're like well you look, I hear this, you look normal. <laughs> you, exactly. you sound normal. And I'm like, I am normal. I'm just trying to be as healthy as I can. Um, right. So Mike, why don't, can you explain, you know, what your website's about, your, your programs that you do uh, and what they can gather, you know, if they're searching and they're like, I, I need to start moving forward here. What, um, what resources and where can they go to get some help here? Yeah, I mean, sugaraddiction.com, we got a quiz there. And I always say, if you, if you made your way to sugaraddiction.com, by whatever means, you probably don't need to take the quiz. If you can, but it's a good quiz. But we got a book there that's free to download. Um, you see it right on the page. Uh, it, it's on, it was on Amazon Kindle, too. So you can either buy it or you can go to the website and download it for free. Um, and we have a 30-day challenge. So the 30-day challenge is very simple i mean you get a video every day you get to join our forum you get to join these zoom meetings we have every uh you know during the week uh we're trying to get them seven days a week uh and it's that support system that uh really helps you um to move into the next level and i like your analogy around alcohol and i want to remind people that aa alcoholics anonymous started because it was stigmatized back in the day mm. and 30 years ago 35 years ago when I got sober, it was also stigmatized, you know, and now you're right. There's a big shift in people accepting of people who decide to quit drinking. And I think that's happening with sugar, you know? And another thing is too, like uh, one of the last uh, things I want to leave the folks with is that um, they need to know why they're going to do this. If they can write down the, you know, they want their health, back. They want to be able to dance at their children's grandchildren's weddings. Uh, they want to be able to play on the floor with their kids. If they know, if the life that they're leaving is not, if the life that they're going towards is not bigger than the life they're leaving, they're not going to make it. If they're just kind of doing it to lose a few pounds, you know, whatever, you've got to really write this stuff down and know why you want to do it, right? Then you have to tape it on your mirror and you have to look at it every day. Um, you know, we, it's just so important for you. And, and what I found is so weird that I, I, I naturally, I mean, maybe I was a daydreamer, I don't know, but I always thought about the future, like what's going to go next? What's going to happen next? You know, what, like I would think about it and come to find out, you know, a lot of the personal development programs around there and, uh, you know, all of the books out there are focused on this visualization of the future. And if you can't visualize yourself as a falling to a right size body, um, you know, healthy and energetic and happy again, uh, you know, or maybe off your diabetes meds. I mean, there's so much now proven fact of people changing their diet and, and literally being cured of diabetes too. cured. Right. Not, not talking about like it. Well, they call it in remission, obviously, but you know, they're, they no longer have to take diabetes meds. The tests say they do no longer have diabetes too. So a lot of positives out there, but you got to know where you're headed with it. But yeah, it's, uh, it's very doable nowadays. Okay. It's, it's happening, but I wouldn't, you know, caution folks that most of the quote unquote sugar detoxes are going to focus around food and, uh, and, and exercise. And, and they're going to try and paint pretty pictures of stuff that used to have sugar in it and like whatever uh, sugar-free cupcakes or something like it's not possible to create that product it's just you know the keto snacks have proven this right i have so many people who are keto junkies mm -hmm. vegan junkies people who you know uh, they eat all these keto snacks and they wonder why they're not losing weight you know and so you know, you got to be careful out there in the marketplace. It's, it's a different world. It, it, it's like, it, you know, these products, I guess they're okay, but they're not going to help you in the long run. So anyway, just a quick caveat. Yeah. And it's, it's about marketing. You know, it's yeah. people say that all the time. Well, it's paleo, you know, it's whatever they're saying. I'm like, it depends on where the source is coming from. You can market yeah. just about anything today. 
Um, yeah. But I love I love the why, and and that is so true. If you're listening, when you're done, when you're done listening to this podcast, or when you get home, take out a pen and paper in a quiet place and write your why down. Write where do you want to be in a year, five, ten, twenty years? I tell mm-hmm. my kids, um, I want to live to 120 at least, and I and I want to write a book, no diapers for me. So <laughs> I said, you're not going to have to change my diaper. I'm going to still be driving my car. I'm going to have fun. And uh, they just like, right okay. there, brother. <laughs> so same and, goal. Yeah. So, and it was, it was funny. My, so I say this now and when I say it and I have that, why if it's either a pipe dream or I do action steps. So I, I continually say it, run my mouth on it. It makes me live up and holds me accountable and when my dad died, this is interesting. I was in college studying health and physical education before chiropractic. And my dad died of heart disease at age 50, had his final heart attack, died at 50. And I remember at that time, I looked at what happened, how that devastated our family. And I thought, this is not happening to me. That's mm-hmm. all I said. I, I didn't know how. I thought it was just through fitness. I really didn't understand nutrition. I didn't understand chiropractic. I didn't understand belief and mind, habits, any of that. I just said, I declared, this will not happen to me. And because mm-hmm. I declared it, and my why was, I, I'm going to be healthy and strong for my kids. And I'm going to, and it was funny, um, Mike, I said, when we have five kids, and my youngest is 16, probably about 15 years ago, 16, 17 years ago, when the kids were growing up, I said, I said to myself, I probably told them or told my wife, I'm going to be healthier and stronger than all my kids until they're at least 16, at least, (laughs) you know, because 16 hormones kick in. Well, I had four girls and then I had a boy. My boy was last. And I said, son of a gun, I'm going to be 54 when he hit, when he hit 16. Well, he's 16. And I can still, I'm still stronger than him. He can beat me in, in some races and we do these pull-up challenges and I still have him in a lot. So I, I've achieved my goal. <laughs> and now I'm like, oh, I just want to keep going. I know I don't want them to catch me, but my, it goes back to my why. My why was I'm not going to die and leave my kids without a dad. And I want them to have a fun dad. So I've always incorporated working out, healthy eating, and reading and listening to podcasts like this. And always, this this just consumes my life in a good way that I'm always trying to learn more. I am mm-hmm. far from being perfect and have a perfect habit uh, lifestyle, but my why is big and it keeps pulling me. So I love that that you added that in because if you don't have a why, you'll you'll be you'll last a day and then yeah. you'll have a headache, you'll feel sick. You'll have this toxic rush to your brain of toxins because you're detoxing. You're like, ah, see, it's not for me. Uh, but if your why is big enough, you'll get through that day in two and three. So I love it. And um, so your 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 website, sugaraddiction.com, we're going to have all your links on our show notes. Go check this out. And folks, just like we say on every show, take action steps. Don't sit there and think, well, that's cute. What a nice... What a nice guy. Good for him. Do it. And even if, even if you were 50% successful, that's it. And you did that for the rest of your life. That's way better than being a hundred percent not successful, you know? So, right. but I, and I think too, once, once they start entering this world, I tell my patients, once you begin getting healthier, it's mm. very hard to go back. You know, if you know yeah. and feel what good feels and you, like you said, eat that sugar, I'm like, wow, that is sweet. Mm. Blech. It's, it's oh, I get that line that. all the time. I didn't know I could feel so good. That's the line. They yeah. Said. I didn't I didn't realize I could feel so good. I get that all the time. I hear it too. And and it's a world that you don't want to leave. Uh, so take action steps today. Go to Mike's website. Get on that 30-day challenge. And even if you have to do the 30-day challenge 10 times to be successful, do it. Doesn't matter. You're gonna you're gonna gain great things from it. So um, as we kind of wrap things up here, uh, what any any fun crazy plans for the future oh i can't even be get you're you're hitting my hot button there oh my goodness let me preface it with this every time i say this i only had one lady on the show i said you know i'm waiting for somebody to say jump out of an airplane she she started laughing she goes i I plan to jump out of an airplane but everyone else says they're writing a new book they're going to do a new class everything's about health okay Hit us with it. I want to hear hear these fun, crazy. Oh my ones. god! I can't. <laughs> my 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 
uh, ops guy. It's like he, I, he can't. He said, "All right, Mike, that's fine. What are we gonna do today?" Kind of thing, you know. Uh, you know, one of the things that's my passion is the and the. I have a little Facebook group called Sugar Free Kids, and um, you know, I own SugarFreeKids.com, and I'm gonna put that website up soon. So that's kind of awesome. a real passion of mine. Uh, because like I said, we got to start, we literally have to change the next generation. We, we, you know, it's not, we're not going to make it that we're going to have a spotty success over the next 20 or 30 years with the folks that are, you know, between 40 and 70 now, right. but we've got to start moving this to the next generation. So that's a, a big thing of mine, of mine. And probably really, you know, I, I could name a hundred other things that I want to do, but that's probably top of mind. One of the things that I, I wanted to get out there. You know, we need to have more folks, uh, do, adults doing it now, and they are just, you know, part of the process. We get more sugar-free folks out there, but really want to get it to the kids. I want it because look, it, it's a, you know, it's a huge cultural societal change that has to happen. And it, you know, I can't remember who said it, but you know, nothing worth doing happens in one lifetime kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So it's a long-term project, but mm -hmm. Got to, somebody's got to start somewhere, you know, so, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's great. So no jumping out of airplanes though for you. <laughs> you know, people, I'm not a car guy or a boat guy or, you know, I mean, <laughs> I, it's like, uh, I, I don't know if, you know, my own personal goals is, you know, I, I like the remote life of working online. And so I've lived in a lot of cool places uh, over the last 15 years. And I like the idea of like being able to do this from Costa Rica or whatever. Nice. So if that's a, if that's a goal, I'll put, I'll throw that one in. That's fun. That's fun. I love it. Um, and I'll tell you what, the next generation, that is a, a big nut to crack, but unless I tell my kids, I said, look, you see how healthy I am and, and you and my wife, I said, you guys can be twice as healthy as me. Cause you started from day one. We mm. started this process in your genetics, your your DNA is going to be better and cleaner. And when you have kids, they're going to go to a new level if you keep living this life. And what's interesting is I saw my kids, um, my oldest is 28 now, and I saw them hit about 18, 20, 22, that age when they started to like, huh, I wonder what pop really tastes like. <laughs> Cause we never had <laughs> pop in our house, soda in our house. And uh, I saw them drinking it and starting to go down like, uh Oh, this is bad. And I thought, if I push them, they're going to rebel more. And I just backed off and it like, I taught them the way they should go. I taught them the way they should go. They're going to come back as a, you know, a biblical proverb, you know, mm. teach your kids in the way they should go. And, and in the end, they'll come back. And I'm like, okay, I'm banking on this. Well, what's funny now they've completely reversed, went like 180 degrees the other way. And some of my older girls, when they're making dinner, they make healthier dinners than I could ever even come up with, you know, they're like, Oh, yeah. we added this. And I'm like, ah, oh, this is wonderful. They exercise, they live healthy. It's just, they've incorporated this into their lifestyle and right. they used to get teased at school. Like, like you're eating a mango. What's that? <laughs> and right. you don't have a sandwich. You know, what's your, you're making eating soup. And I still, I pack my kids lunches. I, I think, my wife may have packed some, but I packed my kids. I still pack my 16 year old's lunch because he, you know, I let him, you know, do what he has to do in the morning. I'm like, I'm packing your lunch because I know what you're taking to school and you're going to eat healthy. And uh, they never complain. So I love what you're doing for the next generation. Um, we're going to have all your, your resources. Please, folks, go check this out. Spread the message. Please share this podcast uh, with other people. Share this and tell your friends to listen to this. Like it. Subscribe. And, and make a review. We want this to be hot. This episode right here can transform the world. If we transform our health, we're transferring from our minds, our health of the next generation. This will be a tipping point for everything. So, Mike, I appreciate you being on the, on the show. I love your information, um, and I'm excited to learn more. So thank you. Thank you for having me. You guys, this is awesome, and it's a, a real pleasure. You're real, like... <laughs> I do a few of these and you know, you're really an advanced educator. Like a lot of people are not open-minded to some of this stuff. So it's very, very refreshing. Thank you. Well, thank you.